to the For the Feeling podcast. I'm not sure what episode we're on, but we're happy you're here. I think this is episode like three, maybe four. I think it's only three. And when was However, our, when was our last episode? Like a while ago. It may have been months ago, but we're here now, and that's all that matters. Thank we, you for joining us. We have a special guest today. Yeah, um, this will be our very first wedding videographer guest that we've had on the podcast so really exciting stuff and I mean he happens to be a pretty freaking awesome videographer that I'm sure a lot of you know and admire and respect and are inspired by because we are and um his name is Stanton Giles films by Stan round of applause (laughs) um so we know him as Cody. Um, that's his first name, which I'm pretty sure he mentions when he introduces himself. But um, Cody has been an amazing mentor to us and has encouraged us and guided us and given us so much wisdom, especially as we dove into Destination Weddings for the first time this past year, 2022. Um, and he has just taught us so much. And so we are really excited to just kind of have him on and um, just share a little bit of his journey and give some valuable insight into what it looks like to be a destination wedding videographer, the realities. Yeah. We're going to share our, our experiences so that you don't have to go through them. Yeah. And if you do, you know how to navigate them. Right. So let's jump right into it. Give it up for Stanton Giles. All right, everybody, we are here with Stanton Giles with Films by Stanton. He's here. <laughs> Hello, it is me. So introduce yourself. I'm sure most people that are watching know who you are already, but just give us a synopsis of who you are, what you do with your life. <laughs> Sweet. Um, Hello, my name is Stanton Giles. Some know me as Cody, which is my first name. Others know me as Stanton. Rob and Adeline know me as both. Um, I give people the Cody token whenever we become friends and Stanton as my uh, my business shield in a way. Um, it's also branding. But anyway, uh, middle name Stanton. Um, I'm a travel wedding videographer. It's what I dub myself because I'm, I travel just to shoot regular weddings, whether it's Napa or Alabama or New York, um, or if it's a micro wedding, an elopement or destination wedding shooting all kinds of weddings all over the world. And um, most of those do not happen in Denver, Colorado, where I live. And I enjoy what I do. It gets tiring sometimes, which we might be talking about a little bit today based off of what we've talked about before this. And uh, used to be an engineer, do a long story of kind of trying to chase what my heart most wants in life and making sure that I'm making the most of the time that I'm given, um, chafed away at the block of figuring out who I am. And, um, through a long story of moving out of the country, working at an orphanage in Honduras and coming back and dabbling in engineering again, and then having the pretty normal standardized story of, uh, filming friends weddings for the first year. And then slowly that exponentially growing over the next year, I was able to quit engineering again be a full-time wedding videographer. Um, and then that ended up transforming into basically doing full-time destination weddings was in West Tennessee at first, uh, unknowingly close to, to Cine garden over here. Uh, we didn't know each other at the time. Um, and, um, now I'm in Denver, Colorado and Denver's a great hub for all things travel as far as, uh, you know, flying direct anywhere. And so shooting, less than 10 weddings a year now doing a lot of education in regards to travel wedding videography um you know came out with my course rome the travel wedding videography course back end of march and um it's been great we just put out our free uh, the announcement of the free workshop that's going to be just for rome students for you know investing in me but also choosing to invest in you know the course as well and you know just showing that they they care about it so that's not a sales thing i'm just saying that's what's up with my life and what i've been doing and kind of working on planning that right now this summer awesome yeah i was gonna ask uh what you've been up to but you kind of answered that question with like the well, things with rome yeah, and stuff that like and that. gardening yeah gardening right how's gardening. that going hold on 
home improvement, backyard renovation. Yeah, how's the uh, patio furniture going? Can you, let's see. Look at these. Uh, look at these. Those radishes? I was going to say beets. Uh -huh. but... They're freaking popping. It is like, I think the drought is over in Denver, Colorado, uh, or Colorado in general. Um, we've gotten almost like six inches of rain in the last month, um, which it, it's been insane. Um, and so yard work has been kind of on pause because it's kind of just a muddy, goopy mess back there right now. Um, but it has been restful, you know, doing things, gardening uh, post Rome, which was an overextension of my spirit uh, and just my my ability to work. My tank was on E and every time I tried to fill it back up, I realized it was more my ego of wanting to work rather than my spirit actually being ready. And so, um, not to get hippy dippy with it, but, um, but yeah, so yeah, that's kind of what I've been up to just been starting to camp camping seasons, getting here and, um, concert seasons here. The nuggets are in the finals right now. And so, um, apparently that's historic. I'm not a big sports guy, but, um, been enjoying bandwagoning with the friends and going and watching it at a, you know, sports bar at somebody's house or something like that. And so, yeah, just kind of enjoying life and getting back into a routine of being at the office, you know, from nine to four, nine to five, something like that on weekdays and enjoying the nights and the weekends like a normal human. Sweet. Well, I know that you've been on a bunch of podcasts talking about destination weddings and we are going to talk about destination weddings, but instead of kind of going the route of, just talking about like how you get destination wedding work because you already have a great YouTube video out on that. I feel like you have multiple videos out on that on your channel and stuff. There's so much good content out there um, about that. But I kind of want to talk about like just the realities of doing destination wedding work because I feel like there's definitely a lot of misconceptions about it. Um, I mean, we just had our first year of diving into destination weddings and um, had a lot of very interesting experiences, <laughs> inconvenient, tiring, <laughs> unexpected, stressful. There's a lot of things that go into it that I think that people just don't realize because on Instagram, it looks like the best thing you could possibly do with your life. <laughs> Um, yeah. I reached out to an old buddy the other day and he was like, dude, your life looks so awesome. Like, yeah, all of our friends are like, y'all are just living the dream. I'm like, all right, well, you don't get, you don't see all the other stuff. So that's kind of <laughs> what we're going to be talking about a little bit. Yeah. And that's not to say that we're not all grateful for what we do. And this yeah. is not a podcast to like sit and complain about our jobs or anything like that. It's just the reality that I think people should probably be aware of if they're going to dive in so yeah. you know just starting out uh when you first started doing destination weddings um did you have any like just off the top of your head any weird or stressful situations in the beginning i wouldn't say there was like any particular situation in the beginning that was any different than a normal situation that I would have going forward, if that makes sense. Like, so I've had kind of consistently, not every single time that I travel, but consistently, um, you know, things that kind of pop up as far as um, the security of making sure that I get there or the stress of making sure that I get there, um, the security and stress again of maintaining your gear um, while traveling, but also exposing it to the elements. Inherently, a destination wedding is normally not taking place inside. It's a destination wedding or an elopement, which is obviously outside. But a destination wedding, they're going somewhere to be in that place. Uh, I don't know if I've ever shot a destination wedding that was inside, unless it was like pouring rain or something. Um, and I've shot them in the pouring rain too. Um, and so... Um, there's not a particular story like that, like in the beginning, like that kind of stands out. I would say it's more so like I had to imagine, think back to like my first destination wedding, which was a free wedding in Iceland um, and reached out to a bunch of planners, got this, you know, it's a different story. You can look up that YouTube video about how to book destination weddings, but I had this um, Iceland couple and flew to Iceland and um I mean, inherently, even if you're shooting a local wedding, there's a ton of stress surrounding 
even just getting out of your car and walking up to a room full of bridesmaids or groomsmen or mother of the bride and timelines and all these different things, because inherently a wedding day is a stressful, uh, impactful, important day. It's the biggest day of most people's lives. Uh, I know it's going to probably be for me and it's one I'm really looking forward to. And so there's a lot that people plan for, for it. And so it's a lot riding on you as the memory capturer, the, uh, to, to make sure you do it right. Well, add on top of that travel and, you know, driving around Iceland. So we, I was going to Iceland anyway, and I was like, I'm going to double dip and get this wedding. And so me and my friend are there. He's a videographer as well. We're both going to basically split this wedding, you know, and be able to use it for both of our businesses. And, um, we get there and we're driving around, you know, the big ring road that goes all the way around Iceland. Well, Iceland isn't exactly the size of Rhode Island. It might seem small up there, but driving around Iceland takes a long time. And uh, I just remember even in the summer, the weather was getting like super bad up north and we were driving around um, end of June and like having to make sure that we got back to this hotel that was going to check us in and that latest check-in was like 11 p.m at night but it's the middle of june and it's you know if you've been there in summertime you know that it's like you can lose track of time really easy because it's 10 o'clock everything's closed around you and you're hungry and you're like wow the sun looks like it's 4 p.m and i just started getting hungry and so um losing track of time having to get back to an airbnb before their check in time closes which is like kind of bizarre having to deal with that anyway but that's kind of stuff that you don't expect when you're traveling to other countries or different states or whatever it might be which is a different way of doing things and so we got to get there so we can charge all of our gear because we can't charge it in this van like we can charge one drone battery every three hours in this van and like we're depleted and like we're just flying our drones like crazy the wedding days the next day and so there's just like a, i just remember it was a my buddy was like super tired and, and he had a sleep medication that he took <laughs> i think it was Ambien. Um, that he took and he couldn't really drive. And this was also my first time like learning to drive stick shift. And so I'm like trying to hustle, but I'm also driving this van through Iceland in the northern part with inclement weather trying to hit like a, it sounds a lot worse than I think the actual experience was. But when I think back to kind of like thinking, processing through that first experience, I was like <laughs> a lot more writing on this than, um, than a, a regular wedding that I drive 20, 30 minutes down the road record and have my home base and my cushy bed to wake up in and my alarm clock and all my batteries charged and you know being able to eat breakfast in my own hometown and know you know just there's a way different i mean you'll be much more prepared walking out to go to the grocery store than you would you know it'd be it's a lot easier doing that than getting on a plane and going to iceland just inherently and so same thing applies for you know weddings and so um i would say that like generally there's just this added stress of everything's got to go right yeah from the shuttle to, you know, driving to the airport, hoping there's not traffic to hoping that the shuttle, you know, drops you off in time, that there's not going to be a two hour line yeah, here in Denver International Airport to hoping that your bags get there to, to not, you know, hoping they don't take out your saying you have too many batteries in your bag um, or taking out your Allen wrenches because they look like a little, you know, like a weapon or something. I don't know if you guys ever had Allen wrenches taken out, but. They always think that our, like the small rig handles, they think that that is some kind of weapon every time they take those out. They're I've like, had, what is I've this? I've had them look at that too. Um, and so, you know, going through that and then getting to the right gate and then making, you know, you've always heard horror stories of overbooking flights. And then, I mean, the obvious thing of like, hopefully my flight gets there and that my next flight, um, which I don't have to worry about as much. I know in Memphis, I worried about it a lot more because everything was a layover. Uh, but Denver, there are more direct flights places. So once I get on the plane, I feel a lot better, but still, I mean, like um, you never really know. I mean, there's definitely been times I've been flying in somewhere and they can't land because of fog or inclement weather or something. And so, um, you know, uh, I'm kind of blasting through some stories here. I can keep going, but uh, you know, like this most recent wedding, the Bahamas, I've been pretty fortunate with not having, you know, a lot of people, they, when they are preparing to, book their flights for their destination wedding let's say you're going to do friday saturday sunday coverage well they're going to fly if they're going to do friday saturday sunday coverage and they're only recording friday night for that welcome party on friday night then they're going to fly in thursday night just to make sure and then they're just going to sit around all day friday well i'm like 
I'm like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, but I don't want to just waste my time in this country, which might sound kind of <laughs> interesting to hear. But after traveling so much, it's like, I really enjoy being home now. And so I want to be home as much as I can. I don't want to spend an extra day on this work trip. Um, and so like, I will book flights that same day to fly in there. So I'm like risking it a little bit. And so Bahamas um, was a layover flight um, getting there in February. And we were going to get in around 2 p.m. And the welcome party was like at 6 p.m. And so it was like four hours. And the hotel was like 30 minutes from the airport. Um, and so I get a notification that our flight the next morning, me, me uh, and my girlfriend, she was going to be my second shooter. Uh, it was delayed, which our, we had a short connection in Atlanta. And so that was going to make us miss our flight. And so I'm on the phone with the the airline. They're like, well, can you, and this is like 10 o'clock at night, uh, the night before Then I'm like asking them what we can do. And she's like, well, there's a flight leaving Denver in an hour and a half, um, you know, going to Atlanta. And I looked over at Lisa, my girlfriend, and I was like, are you ready? Are you packed? And she was like, yeah, I was like, you ready to jump in the car right now? And she's like, let's go. And so I was like, all right, book the flight. And I told the lady. And so she booked the flight and we just like, you know, I'm not, I'm not super close to Denver International Airport. It's like a good 35 minute drive. Thankfully, it was late at night. So we sped through it, parked right at there at the airport, $28 a day, ran onto there. We got onto the flight and we made it. But I mean, like, even still, I was worried. I was like, I still got to get this connecting flight from Atlanta to Bahamas. Um, and so like that is more of a horror story of not horror story. It could have been a horror story. Um, but this is like things that can happen with flying. And so um, I'll shut up for a second, let you guys talk about some stuff too. But um, but yeah, that, that was like a recent experience that I had with it. There's just so many like variables and moving parts that you like don't think about it until you actually do it. Like our first destination wedding. We it's actually pretty similar to yours because or your first story about Iceland. Um, as you were talking about that, I was like, man, this is funny that it's kind of a similar situation. Yeah. But one of the things that we had written down was we did a four day streak last June where it was Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, we had weddings. And on Friday it was in Memphis. Saturday was in Oxford. Um, yeah, Sunday was in New York. It was in uh, long, it was in long Island. Yeah. And then on Monday it was, uh, Iceland. And so when, so thankfully it was at midnight, uh, the Iceland wedding. Yeah. And so it was technically, I guess you could say it was Tuesday, but we had to get to Iceland. We had to travel to where it was. And so we were going to the southernmost part. We went um, from, I, th I mean, every morning was an early morning uh, on that four-day streak. And we yeah, ended it. Yeah, and then it at, after the wedding, we had to back everything up because we're, we sh we don't, like, have 10,000 SD cards like everyone else somehow does, even though they cost, like, $300 a piece. Um, <laughs> so, I, we you know, we'd, like, we'd back everything up. And so we'd be up till, like, 2 a.m., go to sleep, get up. We literally, we put our clothes in the washing machine and wear the same clothes the next day yeah. for the next wedding. Um, but it was, like, anything it took to get that Iceland wedding. We were, like, we're doing it. We don't care. <laughs> yeah, so we got to Iceland, and Adeline's phone, she had an international plan, and it was, like, geeking out your phone was acting so weird and yeah. we didn't know where to go from the airport and i guess it was just having trouble adjusting to being in iceland or whatever it was but i had no idea where to go i had no directions to where it was and so i just started driving in just like a random signs. yeah trying to figure out where i was going like going through the capital like all these streets and we're Gosh, exhausted. Was, we were so exhausted. I was so stressed out. Adeline was so tired. Like, she wanted to go to sleep. We were backing up stuff in the car, I remember. And we were charging stuff because yeah. the wedding was that night. Right. So, like. So, we had to drive three hours to the southernmost part of Iceland. And I remember Adeline fell asleep and I was in the car. And thank God, genuinely, that we had this Toyota Yaris and I I would start dozing off because I was so tired and the car 
if it if it was going one way or the other the steer the steering wheel would shake and so it would like wake me up and if we didn't have that car i think we would have been in a whole different situation a whole different story we'd be talking about but um we might not have been here maybe not. we might not exist anymore <laughs> well i know that inherently being in every flight that gets into iceland is like 4 four thirty in the morning to 6 a.m or even you know and so just inherently starting off your trip in iceland is a uh, is an exhausting thing um especially driving you know to even really get to the real part of iceland that i enjoy you have to drive a few hours yeah yeah. And then, like, not to mention, actually, just shooting there is like the conditions are super unfavorable. Like, it's misty and freezing and windy, and like, well, it can be like that for one minute, but then yeah, the next be... minute, you need to, you know, strip down to your t shirt. Yeah. Yeah. It's so weird. So, but yeah, we, like, I feel like that our first experience was truly like we were thrown into the fire, and which I think was good. And yeah. I think also another thing is even though you're like super tired is that like you're so you at least in the beginning you're like running off of adrenaline because it's like your first time you know doing something like that. So I just remember like not even understanding how we were still functioning but it was like we were so excited there was just so much adrenaline. And I think that that's like a that's a good it's a good thing to feel. I think it's not to overuse the word inherent, but I think being excited uh, is a good thing for for making sure that you produce a good product. Um, it can it's going to also help you persevere through a lot of those headaches of having to offload in the car or charge your batteries in the car. Mm -hmm. Having an excitement is a, I think, necessary for any anything that we're doing even if you are shooting you know barn weddings in west tennessee or luxury weddings or whatever it might be in regards to weddings uh, if you lose that excitement yeah uh, i would i would say to kind of do a check of of take stock of where you're at uh, at yeah. the same time because uh, i've also lost the excitement for the places i think what gets me excited now with the bookings is price point and i am still passionate about having satisfied clients making sure that they like what they're getting and so that is the fuel behind me i was sitting there thinking of another story last year in tulum my little bungalow hotel that i was staying in on this strip of tulum have you guys been to tulum um we have a long time ago, ago. Yeah, it, was it like wasn't for a wedding you I mean, know it was like that main strip kind of next to the it's like the fake tulum for tourists it's not like the real tulum but the, the fake tulum is the disney world of mexico i like to call it because it's not really anything real other than this curated experience for tourists and very tight road very bumpy road i don't know why they don't upgrade that road but i'm a good quarter mile away from the venue that the couple is getting married at and so I have on my person most of the time my big peak design backpack and I have my my roller bag, my um what do you call it? Think tank. Think point think tank airport security V3.0. <laughs> nice long, nice long name. But I always have those two with me, but I'm not gonna roll it down this dirt, gravelly road. So I'm holding it. And I have my rigged out camera around my neck. And I remember I got splashed with some, I was wearing a, it might sound like a, a taboo thing to do, but I was wearing a white dress shirt and some shorts and some chacos that day. Cause I knew I was going to be, it was so hot. It was the middle of August in Tulum and I wanted to be comfortable, but still look good. And this car splashed mud on me. And then this other car immediately after like kind of bumps into me and it made me drop my camera and I just show up to this wedding sweaty from walking a quarter mile holding this holding this think tank carry bag because I'm not rolling it and my backpack my camera's got the 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 monitor is off the camera and I have to use gaffer tape to tape it to it and I just look like a mess stumbling into this wedding and I'm like I'm here 
I just got hit by a car. And then one of the groomsmen, like, he just latched onto that all day. And he kept, every time I came around, he'd be like, dude, the videographer, he got hit by a car on the way here the whole day until like the very end of it. Everybody knew by the end of the day I got hit by a car. Um, so yeah, that was a interesting situation. Uh, uh, unexpected things happening. I can't remember exactly why I brought that story up, but that's a, just another example of things that you wouldn't expect having to do walking down the street in Mexico, holding all your gear in the middle of the summer. It's not fun sometimes, but, uh, I, oh well, yeah, I guess the driving factor behind all of that was I wanted to, obviously I was there, I was getting paid. I had to do this regardless of my level of passion at that point. I could have been really begrudging about it, um, or super in on it. I felt closer to being super in because I was motivated by the price point that, you know, the couple had hired me for, uh, and, and making sure I made them a really good film because they had seen other films of mine that got them really excited. At this point, I've been to Tulum like eight times. And so the place isn't actually exciting me anymore. Um, but I think being excited by the place and having that passion inside of you is a good driving factor for motivation in the beginning. And hopefully other people there's other, there, I'm not like everybody else. I, I'm the known as the travel dude in the industry, but to a certain extent, it's a misnomer because I, I love making dinner at home and sleeping in my bed and playing with my dog and hanging out with my girlfriend and, and being here in Denver and nesting to a certain extent. Yeah. Well, going back to the gear thing, it's uh it's funny you bring that up too. Cause we, when we went to Italy and it was like a joint trip with Italy and Switzerland, we had a wedding I think it was August 3rd in Italy and then in Switzerland, August 21st. And so it's quite a, a long gap of time there. And we did a bunch of traveling on the way, but we had our backpacks, which were decked out with all of our gear, and super heavy. And they're then, like these cheap Amazon backpacks and they were so uncomfortable. Like Yeah, just, they were they were tearing up like the whole time we were there and we we're like, we need good bags, man. Yeah. Um and I also I'm telling you guys on Patreon. That's true. Um we also brought the FPV drone and I didn't pack it because it was that big DJI. Uh, I didn't have like an easy way to pack this drone. So I bought a hard case and it was like, it was like a solid, like 15 pounds. I mean, I, the, the case alone. Yeah. I think with the Probably drone in it and stuff, and batteries it, and all that kind of stuff, it got pretty heavy. And so I was like walking through the airport with this thing. I was getting on the plane. I was walking everywhere with it, you know, we somehow got away with carrying that on as a personal item too. And every like airline, they would like look at it like, yeah, they were skeptical. That's like another carry on, but they would like, for some reason, let us bring it on. Yeah, it was a, uh, it was not a good situation. So definitely making sure that like in the moment it was like, okay, I've got this case. I'm protect Like I'm protecting this, this drone, but I didn't think about all the times I would be like my hand by the end of that trip my right hand was like had blisters on it and and the handle to that case is like peeling apart because of how much i carried that thing yeah. it was just such like it was just a, a burden to have while we were trying to navigate all these different travels throughout italy and switzerland but yeah i mean just making sure that your gear is taken care of and like you know that is this going to be an inconvenience kind of thing is yeah. like really important to know. Yeah. I feel like every travel wedding that we've done at this point, like we've kind of perfected what we travel with and like eliminated things that were like really unnecessary. Cause that like just Iceland, the first one, gosh, we brought so much freaking stuff, but we forgot our drone charger. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you know that story. Yeah. But yeah, we forgot our drone charger. We realized on the flight over there because I, I was the one packing the chargers and I realized that I had left it. And uh, Adam was like, did you bring the drone charger? I was like, no, I actually didn't. And so every percentage mattered while we were in Iceland. And we didn't even know there's actually a DJI store in Reykjavik, but we didn't know that until we until we had left. And so like 
we could have bought one, but we made it work. How do you guys feel but... about um how do you guys feel like redundancy in the gear that you bring? Meaning like bringing extra of things in the likely albeit unlikely event that something breaks and you don't have access to go to a store because you're in the middle of the Dolomites or you're in Iceland. You guys ever, I mean, that contributes to a lot of the gear that I have. I have I've I want to say I bring two of everything, but when it comes to HDMI cables and chargers and uh, charging hubs and SD cards and cards and, and lavalier mics and stickies, like all these other things, batteries, like I got a lot extra. Yeah. Honestly, we could probably stand to have more extras of certain things, but yeah. But even on our trips, we early on, like she was saying, the Iceland one, and even our trip to Italy, we had to cut back on a few things because obviously we were there for so long. Yeah. But we still packed a whole lot of things just to make sure we had backups on backups. But yeah, and and then that gets that gets heavy, you know. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I remember. When I was an engineer, um, I used to be a controls engineer and we would work in these big um, manufacturing plants. Are you guys familiar with Pickwick, Tennessee? Yeah. So you know the big paper mill out there? Uh, I'm not I'm not no, sure I'm familiar with um, Counts, Tennessee. It sounds like, uh, smells like sulfur. It's a big paper mill. That's where I spent a lot of my time uh, post-college as an engineer for like two years. and. Um, we were like upgrading all of their wiring between their motors and like these pa these paper mills are huge processes, huge processes that are printing off basically the liner of cardboard boxes, which is not cool in any way, but that's what they did. It was like the thin sheet that was the lining for the corrugated stuff inside of cardboard boxes, but it's a huge industry, tons of money. And I mean, like logging trucks just constantly going into this plant and if the machine the paper machine there was two of them if either one of them ever went down it was like someone's getting putting getting a gun put to their head and they're figuring out why this machine went down and whose fault it is they're head hunting out there because it is upwards of 30 to fifty thousand dollars every 10 minutes that they are losing based off of this thing um I could be wrong completely on that number. I'm pretty sure I remember it being it's for sure in the tens of thousands every every 10 to 20 minutes that that they're losing money. And I remember it was very important. You know, there's lots of logic built in here that like, you know, this temperature valve sends this signal here, then, you know, then this motor will shut off or, if you know, something happens. But if you ever lose connection somewhere, um, if you ever lose connection, connection then it's going to shut down the machine but you don't never really know exactly where because there's so many logical pathways built into the programming the plc um of this stuff and i remember how important it was to have backups they would have dual temperature valves dual motors all these things just in case something happened whether the motor seized up or the temperature valve lost signal that immediately that the pathway would pick up another pathway and it was such an important process that yeah, it was imperative to have redundancy. And I s tell that story because I, I think about wedding videography in a very analogous way of the wedding day is so important that if any of my my lineup of gear fails in in the time that I'm there shooting, it will affect the end product. Now, on the scale of twenty to $30,000, probably not. I'm still going to be able to make a wedding film if my monitor stops working. Am I going to be able to probably do it as good as I could have? Uh, probably not. I'm very, my, I'm very handicapped on my, uh, my monitor. I have to have it. It's a crutch for me. It makes me feel so motivated. I use manual focus. So trying to look at the, the back of an A7S three little, uh, screen on the back is like just a guessing game at that point, even with the focus peaking, um, you know, and if there's a, there's a, if there's a snag on a lavalier, microphone going from the recorder and a, I can see the wiring. It's probably going to mess up the signal. I might even get like a partial signal or lose signal and not be able to get the audio. So there's so many different things that I think having redundancy for is important on and not to derail the direction we're going with it, but having redundancy increases the amount of gear you have, the more gear that you have, 
the more things you have to take care of, the more prone things are to going wrong. And if something goes wrong, the more gear that is affected by that thing that is going wrong. Does it make sense? Yeah. And that's like, that just brings up like the amount of insurance that you need <laughs> on all of your gear. Like insurance is huge. Like we, Rob lost a, his FPV drone in the Dolomites. So, I mean, like you just never know what's going to go wrong. So for your listeners out there, what, uh, what insurance, uh, would you suggest them go with? Whew, um, well, so we had PPA, um, for like, I guess like a year and a half or something or a year. And, um, we, I looked around because I was curious, like what other companies charged, um, cause PPA we were paying like maybe like 800 something dollars, which isn't that bad, but. I just was curious to see what else was out there. And so we actually s just switched to full frame, but I actually have no idea. A lot of people use them, but I haven't had to like utilize that yet. So I don't know whether or not they're going to be great. You were paying 800 a year or a month? A year. Okay. I was about to say, I was like, that is astronomical compared to what Whoa. I was paying. Oh my okay, God. I was about to say, I don't know. You just breezed over that. <laughs> No, no, no. A year. Um, yeah, that'd be crazy. And I also read a bunch of stuff about how PPA is like, what's the word? Uh, what is the word? It's something about like maybe the rates increase when stuff happens. Maybe. I don't know. I see people talking about it all the time on Facebook and I'm like, okay, so what? Like okay. if you make a claim that they're going to raise the amount of your premium i guess i don't know people just talked crap about it so i was like okay i mean i guess i'll look at something else um full frame is way cheaper it's like half the price speaking of claims oh <laughs> yeah we did have another uh story yeah one more story about this goes into the insurance thing um we were in switzerland and it was the night before the wedding that we were supposed to shoot a uh it was i think midnight right around and i we were on the third floor of this building that was the top floor was an airbnb apartment so we th there was really no reason for anyone to visit us whatsoever and it's midnight and i see these flashlights walking up the stairs towards our front door and um so i go to the door and i'm wondering what these guys are doing and it's these two teenage boys they're they don't really speak English and they're trying to explain to me that they backed into our, our rental car and just so happens that for them that, for at least saying something to yeah, you. Yeah. It was nice of them to come and like talk to us about it. Um, and the kid was 16 and he had, the mom was explaining cause they had to go get their mom. I, anyway, I'm kind of jumping ahead. I went downstairs, I saw the damage and I was like, what do we do? Like call the cops. And, uh, they were like, they just didn't know what I was saying. They didn't understand. So they went and woke up their mom and she was talking to me. She said the kid was 16 years old and that he uh, had been driving for two weeks. And he, and this was the first accident that he had ever been in. And anyway, what any, country is this? This is in Switzerland. And so it was like the French speaking part of Switzerland. And so they were all speaking French and I didn't know what to do. Uh, they also had like an accident report that all, I guess it's like um, a law that they keep an accident report in their cars. And so I was trying to fill this out with no knowledge. I'm, I, I know very little French. Also, you literally went into their house. It's yeah. like the middle of the night in a foreign country. You go into this person's house. Yeah. So it was like the two teenagers, one lived next door to our Airbnb and their parents had woken up and they invited me in and they were like, hosting me at their dinner table and they had at, the other kids parents come too right yeah, the other kids parents came so there were like six people that i'd never met and i'm just in this dining room <laughs> and adeline's upstairs like still at the airbnb yeah, i didn't go over there with him and i ran to get adeline's phone because she had the google translate and so thankfully i had that and that was really the only way that i was able to complete the the little accident report but let me just tell you how big of a headache it was to go through we didn't get the insurance through hertz rental car we got it through our credit card credit card right so that was like the longest process ever it took months it took for like them. three months for them to reimburse us for the damages so we like we basically had to pay two thousand dollars and then get it reimbursed later 
by the credit card company. Yeah, and it it was a really big headache. But the the silver lining in it all, which we didn't even do anything with it, but the dad was super like accommodating and he was like giving me snacks and stuff because I was there for like an hour and a half. It was like 1.30 by the time I left and 1.30 a.m. And the dad was like handing me snacks and stuff and then he gave me a bottle of wine at the end and, and he just did this. He was like, like he just like he couldn't t- speak English so he, he was just, like, like just trying to heart, communicate like knowing like you know this is I'm sorry that this happened but yeah so that's just a funny story and it was pretty aggravating at the time just because it I wasn't aggravated at the situation it was just more like on the back end with all the insurance and stuff yeah that's um, annoying. but yeah um so I wanted to ask you like so since you've been doing this a while now obviously have you kind of perfected like how you actually go about um like dealing with couples and planning travel and like booking everything like how have you kind of streamlined that process so that you're comfortable and taken care of but you're also like mindful of the couple and like what they're having to pay for and all of that yeah um i think first and foremost i think it's good to care about your couple at the same time, they are choosing to go to these places and inherently they're asking others to be invited into it. And when you travel, there's always going to be a certain level of risk involved with going to this place, whether it's Mexico, Canada, Iceland, Switzerland, South Africa, wherever it is for your gear and for yourself. Um, and so first and foremost, as a human and as a business owner, I think you do. I think we're obsessed with taking care of our couples. And at the end of the day, especially with destination destination weddings, travel weddings, you can leave yourself feeling exhausted and beat and not taken care of if you don't take proactive action and steps to making sure that you are taken care of. And I think the biggest way you can do this is through communication, planning, and your contract. And so communicating expectations in the beginning, laying them out clearly, bold, underlined in the contract, Um, and setting those expectations between both the communication and the contract that you're having. And so inside my contract, I have a travel clause. It's like everything's covered for travel by my clients, whether it's a ferry ride in Washington or in Norway, um, parking um, permits uh, or parking, uh, like paying for meters, um, baggage fees, overweight baggage fees, all those kinds of things, gas for rental cars, rental cars, lodging, things like that. Uh, I don't normally charge for food because it's just my personal thing. Uh, I don't really charge a per diem because I would be eating anyway. If I uh, wasn't on this trip, you know, I'd be still doing something. And so while it might be a little bit more, it's my way of like, um, just kind of, I, I do bring it up because it's kind of my way of saying, Hey, I'm also trying to take care of you as well. Um, it might be a little bit, you know, a hundred, maybe $200 for longer trips of loss, especially in somewhere expensive like Iceland or Norway with food. But, um, I, that's just a personal decision. I, I take all that myself, but, you know, making sure that you're taken care of in regards to, um, your finances, because again, uh, kind of talked about this before there's a sweet spot of where people what people are willing to pay for a destination wedding and um if you start dipping in a hundred dollars here two hundred dollars here you know a a parking ticket three hundred dollars here that kind of that on that one the lines get blurry about who's to pay for that um which it's typically my fault but that's again the risk that you kind of take on by going and doing these things but if you're not careful with making sure you're protecting yourself when you're there and beforehand, then your profits go way down um, as you go through these things. And so um, I guess, I guess the next thing I want to want to say in regards to that is just making sure that um, boomers peeking in and saying, hello, Um, (laughs) this little creeper um, is, I guess, setting the expectation you know, with them as well, letting them know in your communication with them that, Hey, you know, I don't know exactly how much travel is going to cost. It cost me $76 to book a flight from Denver to LA it cost me $1,800 to fly to Norway. I don't have a flat rate for travel. 
But what I can tell you is I'm, you know, I'm not going to be booking first class trying to fly. I have a lot of points with United and they fly most places. And so I can get most baggage for free. Um, and I, you know, I, I just want to make sure I'm not trying to book the nicest hotels. I just want to have a nice bed in a safe place that I can sleep in, um, get a working rental car. And I'm not trying to get any, you know, nice rental cars as well. At the same time, I am not going to sacrifice myself for a budget. So I'm not going to be sitting back in the back by the bathrooms. You know, I'm going to pick a seat that's, that's good. So I feel good and rested and uh, stress-free whenever I arrive. I'm going to pick a car that can fit all my luggage and my light stands. I'm going to pick a place that's in a safe area. And so there might, that might be a little more expensive than buying the motel down in the scary section of South Africa or something of the, you know, Cape town. And I watch, I've never been there, but I've heard that it can be a dangerous place. And, um, you know, and so just communicating that on the front end that like, Hey, this is especially for me, like, this is my bread and butter. Like I constantly am doing this. And so please trust me, I have your best interests in mind at the same time of taking care of myself. It's going to be a win-win. Yeah. Um, what have you done to kind of like, what are some tools that you've used to like help you save money on travel? Uh, not procrastinating. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think just like not letting life get ahead of me, uh, which uh, trust me, I've learned the hard way from that and still am learning. Like I got to book a rental car for August in, um, for Iceland for the few days that I'm going before I fly to Greenland, you know, with that voyage that I've told you guys about. Um, as far as saving money on travel, I don't like, I mean, you can go to these websites like Skyscanner and Kiwi and Scott's Cheap Flights and things like that, but you're really dealing with long layovers. You're dealing with not budget airlines and man, I, it's not, that's not a safe game to be playing when you're dealing again with a wedding day, especially when that wedding day is somebody's wedding day. That is your client and this is your business. That is your livelihood. And so, um, I mean, if you're if you're scraping around trying to save fifty dollars here, a hundred dollars here, um, I understand where you're coming from. Trust me, I've been there. And then I'll be in the airport four months later and be like literally banging my head through a cinder block wall of like, why did I want to save fifty dollars to fly with uh budget airline XYZ instead of flying United for fifty dollars more, you know? Um, and so I honestly think. I think it's more of making sure you take care of yourself uh, more than actually trying to find the cheapest way to save money on flights. Because if you think about it, as if you get established in destination weddings and you start doing these things, you have to start taking care of yourself. And you can't be constantly tiptoeing around, oh my gosh, this is getting up to more than what I thought it might be to charge this couple. I'm going to feel so bad charging this to them. You can feel that fear, but do it anyway. You have to do it. And I've never had a couple. I've had uh, $2,800 travel fees before. And I've been like, oh, my gosh, this hurts to send this to this amazing couple I just spent four days with in Norway. But I just flew halfway around the country and spent four days with them in Norway. Here you go. Um, and so it's part of it. And it's kind of I, I, I would actually advise against people trying to save money on travel i think the best way you can do it is just being proactive so you do still take care of your couple but again going back to what i was saying about the communication with them you're taking care of yourself as well which is a win-win totally that's good yeah we have an experience with that we booked a cheaper flight that they didn't warn us whatsoever but we got there on the day of the flight and they had canceled it and no there was email, no remorse nothing. whatsoever from the agent um and so we had to buy a completely new flight um and get there on time so that, that was pretty stressful mm -hmm. yeah i mean it ended up being like an extra two thousand dollars that we had to spend. yeah we saved two hundred dollars on the flights but then <laughs> and we then we had, had to had spend to sp two thousand <laughs> right uh something i want to say and you my guys might have been heading in this direction but i almost kind of wanted to provide a quick like 120 second synopsis of like for your viewers out there of like okay we've been talking a lot about the bad you know, how to talk to your couples, you know, sa saving money here, you know, passing it on to them there. Um, what are some bullet point things that we can tell you that are like, hey, um, do these things to mitigate a lot of the headaches that we're talking about? Is it cool if I jump into that for a second? Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, firstly, don't 
do what I have done historically um, and booking same day flights, book your flights the day before, and then you can fly out the day after the wedding. Uh, depends on what the event is. But, um, you know, if you're breaking into this industry, you know, take an extra day to enjoy the vacation with your your wife, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, or even on your own at these places and uh, save yourself the headache of rushing hoping that the airlines don't mess up or the air or that the traffic doesn't mess up on the way there or that the weather doesn't mess up when at in any time in between that's going to prevent you from from flying halfway across the world you know thousands of miles um making sure that you have uh rain tarps for your backpacks and for your camera gear is very important making sure that you have uh rain gear for yourself making sure that you have warm gear for yourself and making sure that a lot of people get married in warm climates, making sure that you are addressed appropriately for the occasion. Next, having redundancy, making sure that, you know, for things that can get lost easy, like maybe SD cards or SSDs or HDMI cables or audio recording cables, batteries, things like that, make sure you have extra because sometimes running to a store and getting extra batteries isn't as easy as going to Walgreens here in the United States. Uh, right down the road and then um i feel like i'm missing missing a couple things um just making sure that you're booking things on time and uh, booking things without procrastinating and having insurance is going to give you a big peace of mind it's not as expensive as most people would think i have insurance on a fifteen thousand dollar package of an inspire two insured internationally and it cost me like i think 15 dollars a month um, on top of liability insurance and all my other insurance that i have on top of my camera gear having that peace of mind as i go around the world is really important um and then obviously don't book these important weddings with uh book them with reputable airlines don't don't do a you know a budget airline like play going to iceland or um you know book iceland air don't book spirit going to Cancun, book American Airlines or United or Delta or something along those lines, book Southwest Airlines. Um, they're going to make you laugh on the flight as well. So, you know, um, you know I, I would say those are the, uh, and the big other big thing is anything that you need to actually per, uh, execute the wedding other than your tripods and your light stands and potentially your lights, keep on your person at all times. Um, to an obsessive level and protect your laptop at all costs and amidst that. So make sure you have good gear that's going to protect your laptop. I have a Peak Design travel bag with a large camera cube on the inside and a an, uh, Think Tank Air, Airport Security V3.0. It's like a $450 bag. Everything's really protected in it, but it doesn't matter if I'm going to the bathroom, sitting down somewhere, talking to the rental car agent, that stuff is glued to me. Uh, even if I'm taking a nap, I like literally will wrap audio cables around my arms and put my sleeves through my arms through the straps of the backpack to make sure that it's like some would be criminal flying that day. doesn't want to take $20,000 of gear that's laying on my chest, you know? So, um, those are my bullet points that maybe people can take away from the scary things that we think we're talking about as far as, you know, we're not here to scare you. There's a lot of really good things that come from shooting destination weddings. Um, and I am very thankful for those experiences that I have had and the ones that are still to come. Uh, although I'm, you know, entering into a different season of my life where I'm doing far less and doing more education uh, I'm finding myself ignited with passion going and shooting things that are unrelated to weddings in Greenland and doing things along those lines. So I would never be there if it wasn't for destination weddings. And so whether destination weddings are the end goal or it's a it's a catalyst as you continue on finding who you are, I definitely suggest you give them a try and don't be scared by something going wrong, because at the end of the day, like it'll probably work out and things will be OK. Just sucks a lot in the moment. So going off all of your bullet points, we like what you said, we're not trying to scare anybody with these stories. We're just telling our experiences so that you can learn from them because we've done all these things and it's helped us and, you know, helped us prevent things from happening again. And so we're wanting to share these things so that it doesn't happen to you sort of thing. Um, and definitely want to encourage and not discourage you from going this direction, but rather just like, uh, just to help. Yeah. yeah well, you can be real with people and, you know, not have to sugarcoat things. I think, I yeah. don't think anybody's thinking that you're, we're trying to discourage them, but I think it's a good note to make that's like, Hey, we're, we're very pro travel weddings here. Yeah. 
Yeah. I think overall, it's just like, it's good to have just a mindset and like just a mindset of being very adaptable. Like just be, you can't do destination weddings if you're going to be a like stiff, like I like everything to go according to my plan all the time because it's just not going to like you. I feel like you have to become very adaptable and, and just go with the flow, like roll with the punches, go into it as prepared as you can, but also just be prepared for something to possibly go awry or go like not according to your perfect plan. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll kind of start wrapping up, but we've got a couple more questions. Do you want to ask the question you're, yeah. So I wanted to ask, like, how have you navigated a situation where you've gotten an inquiry and, you know, you've had a call and um, how do you know when an opportunity for a destination wedding is a good opportunity, whether it be for your portfolio or whatever, um, or whether or not you should walk away? Because I feel like there are instances, especially when you're first getting into destination weddings, where you're like, I really want this. But there's just some opportunities that you like need to walk away from, whether it be because of the pay or it be because maybe the, the couple isn't just a great fit for you or whatever the case may be. Um, how have you navigated that? And when do you know, like, I guess, where to like draw the line and like walk away from an opportunity because it's just not the right fit for you? Yeah. Um, well, I know us as humans get a bad rap for making stupid decisions a lot, but we're also built into our DNA, we know how to survive, like we can figure out how to survive. And so I think that there's a level of trust that you have to have in yourself of uh, not trying to um, try to invent this nuclear bomb of logic of how to approach a situation, rather listening to what feels right in your gut. And I say that because I think the answer to your question is comparing your excitement level to how how fearful you are. And I'll explain that so you get a, uh, you've never shot a destination wedding and you get a lead that comes in and you're wanting to get into destination weddings. Just to clarify, you get a lead that comes in $800 budget, Iceland four months from now, you're not booked on that day. A couple seems really excited to book you. If you feel excitement when seeing that based off of the opportunity that is arising that's sitting there in your inbox i think that that's a really clear indicator of what you should do because i believe what we should do in life is that which excites our soul that which excites our soul because that which excites our soul is is a cookie crumb on the cookie crumb trail of figuring out what we should be doing in life what we get excited about. And then again, I think that the heart can also be uh, deceitfully wicked. I think that it can be um, misleading as to what is good for us sometimes. But when it's in a pure state like that, when it's something that is going to, that's going to foster excitement and fulfillment inside of you and not, you know, maybe something more negative, like, you know, I'm talking about, you know, the heart's deceitfully lick or uh, wicked, like, you know, it's not going to foster, um, you know, something that's, I almost sound like I'm at church, like impure or lustful or, you know, something that's uh, involved, like a uh, bad, like cheating or lying or something along those lines that's getting you excited. Um, you know, I think it's a clear indicator that that it is something that that you should lean into. Um, and I think that. I think there's consequences to to the decisions that we make, which I think leads into the next thing and say, let's say you are excited about something. You take this Iceland wedding. It's $800. You go negative 4K on this trip. And you're like, ooh. And then you get there and it was raining the whole time. And the couple wasn't super down in the way that you think that they were. But at the end of the day, you're able to make something that's still kind of cooler than what you have on your portfolio anyway as a, you know, a normal local West Tennessee wedding videographer. Um, the next time a lead comes into your inbox, let's just say it's the same exact thing, but it's um, Cancun this time. And you would love to go shoot in Mexico. You guys have been dying to go on a trip there or something. You would love to just make a, you guys need a break anyway. So we're going to book in three days on each side of it. It's kind of your thought the next lead you get in. Let's say exact same budget, kind of set four months out, same scenario, different place after the Iceland thing. 
well, then you might be a little more apprehensive at that point to say yes to it because now you have experience built in and the manifestation of that experience is kind of a heart check of this fear, this anxiety of should I do this? Is this the best thing for me to do? So maybe you enter into that again because it's worth it for you to take this leap. And so there's not a clear cut answer. It very much depends on who you are, what your lifestyle is and what you're wanting to do and what you're wanting to be, I believe. But I think that people should jump and take risk and take action. Uh, and I think that, and I think when I look at destination weddings, travel weddings in general, it is us making the most of our career. It's, it's, it's us taking a stab at that, which is different and not complacent. It's hard going and doing that. That's what we've been talking about this whole time. It's hard mentally, physically. Uh, it's hard on our gear. It, it's hard on the bank account sometimes. Uh, but I believe it's exponentially worth it in figuring out what you want to be doing, igniting passion inside of you, finding fulfillment in life, and at least bringing you to a place where you can then on the other side figure out, okay, maybe we don't want to do much more of that anymore. And that's okay. That's part of life. You're not going to... There's no rule book for for you know the i mean there is a i mean a rule book but i guess you know there's a, a i think objective right and wrong but i think that it's okay to make mistakes and learn as humans and nobody's there that's going to swap your wrist when you get back from iceland and you were negative 4k because of it now you know you know i've been a homeowner and landlord for a couple of years now and i was talking to lisa my girlfriend yesterday that sometimes over the course of those two years the stress of having plumbing problems and electrical problems and concrete facing the wrong way. So water's flowing to the foundation that can eat you up quick, especially, you know, now I have two houses and not just one, but the difference in the handyman that I am now compared to what I was a two years ago is insane. And I was like, I can't wait to see how handy I am when I'm 60, you know, 29 years down the road, because this, these hard things, uh, they, produce perseverance and they produce knowledge and they produce a well-rounded human. And that's what wisdom is. That's why old people are wise. Typically they've experienced a lot of life. And so getting a little bit rabbit trail there, but, you know, listen to yourself and, and, and compare your excitement to your fear level. And is that anxiety coming from uh, the knowledge that you now have uh, and the potential for regret again, you know, regret and you, even though you knew you shouldn't have done it, you're going to be kicking yourself. Um, or is that anxiety coming from, I can't pass up on this lead because this is exciting. Yeah, that's good. And I feel like all in all, it's like, no matter what decision you make, like you are saying, I mean, you're going to learn something from it. You're going to gain something from it, even if it's not what you expected it to be when you took the lead. So yeah, that's good stuff. You want to ask the last question? Yeah, we got one more question. What is your... I'll make this one shorter, hopefully. <laughs> okay. What is the biggest piece of advice you could give someone that wants to get into destination weddings uh, if they're just starting out? Biggest piece of advice I can give is to just go for it. Um, again, I don't ever like sounding hippy-dippy because I'm not a hippie. But I like to kind of use this 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 phrase that's like put the net out there and the fish will jump in in a way and it's this idea that the universe kind of wills into existence that which you put effort into and it's kind of odd how that happens but i've seen it over the course of my life that where i put my efforts and my time and my energy it's like the the door opens in front of me the footstep appears it seems like i'm stepping out into open space and i'm about to fall off a cliff but there's there's a, a solid foothold that appears as i continue to try and to take action stepping forward and so a lot of people are hel are held back from their own anxiety about are they worthy or imposter syndrome a lot of people don't think that people want them to be there because of that exact same re reason or that is some kind of internal struggle that they're having um, other people don't necessarily understand that you have to take action and that those like, you know, us that have gone and have seen success in this have actually gone and done stuff and have actually like really put a lot of effort into it. So whether that's sending cold emails, 
um, to planners and photographers in areas that you're wanting to being intentional, going and just booking a flight. I got a guy that's taking Rome right now that flew to Las Vegas to just do a shoot on a whim just to find people when he got there. And he found some people to shoot in Las Vegas, but he also at some point in the trip found this couple that was eloping in Oregon. And so then he flew to Oregon and shot their wedding. And, and so it's just, you never know where, when you're going to make your break, you never know whenever you're going to get that one thing that's going to explode into this beautiful butterfly effect, which happened in my career and will happen. And I'm sure you've seen in your careers and you will see uh, if you, those that are listening will try and just start doing something. Uh, change does not happen through inaction. You have to take action. So that's my biggest piece of advice. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on and talking with us. This was great. I feel like it's going to be encouraging and probably eye-opening to a lot of people. So Sweet. Well, that's awesome. Well, I appreciate you guys. Hope to see you guys again in Denver soon. We'll go to another Red Rocks concert. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> well, I appreciate it, man. And uh, it's good having you on. <laughs> Thanks. Talk soon. Man, that was some really good stuff. That was so good. I feel like Stanton was just on a roll. It was like a sermon, you know? Yeah. No, there were so many good points that he brought up, and it was inspiring for me. Yeah, great little nuggets in there for you to carry with you. <laughs> to all of your destination travels. Yes, you will have these nuggets to help you along. Yeah, well, thank you guys so much for... <laughs> I don't know what that was. Thank nuggets. you so... <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for joining us. We're happy that you're here, and we're looking forward to the next time that we get to see you. Hopefully, it's sooner than a few months, but we do have... Um, some other people that we're hoping to have on, yeah. not hoping they've confirmed. Yeah, we have They're a little, just, have to little lineup now. We do have a lineup, so be excited about that and be looking out for it because we got some good stuff coming. Yeah, we love you guys. See ya. See ya. <laughs>